I'm Caleb Benjamin, intern at Lawfare, with an episode of Rational Security for September 10th, 2023. For today's episode, the team at Lawfare decided to cross post this week's episode of Rational Security, a podcast hosted by Scott R. Anderson, Quinto Jurassic, and Alan Rosenstein, in which they cover the week's big national security news stories. Today's episode is entitled The Second Anniversary Hot Take Takedown Edition. This week, Anderson, Jurassic, and Rosenstein celebrated the second anniversary of rational security by judging hot takes from their lawfare colleagues on whether there will be a government shutdown in September, what should happen with overseas U.S. troop deployments, and whether Russian President Vladimir Putin or former President Donald Trump will be held accountable first. This is Rational Security. Hey there, Rational Security listeners. Scott R. Anderson here with a quick note before we get started. The universe decided to celebrate our two-year anniversary episode by blessing us with a veritable buffet of technical issues for this recording. We got through it, but the audio quality did suffer a bit. Apologies in advance, but we hope you still enjoy the episode. Guys, two years. Two years of our lives on this, this enterprise. Two years of technical problems with our recording platform as we've been experiencing this morning two years of uh weekly topics and scrambles how has how has it been how does it feel to look back on such a such a long period of time spent together in this virtual space i kind of can't believe that we haven't been kicked off the internet yet like they just let us keep doing it i'm not sure who the they is but yeah i think it's like a section 230 thing i think if i recall correctly (laughs) Oh my! Oh my God! Scott. I was I was gonna say I can't believe we haven't murdered Alan yet and dumped his body somewhere. That's dark. Wow, that's that's dark. You really yeah, you are from New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Pine Barrens. I can show you where to put him. Goodness. Well, this third year might get <laughs> might get heavy. <laughs> we'll see. Might be the might be the last year. It's possible. I'm sorry. I didn't mean for that to come out as rudely. No, it wasn't rude. It was just menacing. It was, it was, you know, good natured joshing. Did you in high school? You were like the most most likely to be criminally prosecuted for <laughs> felony manslaughter. Or something. Weirdly, they did not have that as a superlative <laughs> category, even in the state of New Jersey. Somehow, uh, yeah, and also I was very rule abiding. There you go. Lawful good to the end. Lawful neutral mm-hmm. even. It's not about the moral content. It's just the fact that it's a rule. I don't care. I don't care. It's a rule. Yeah, exactly. I think I've gone from lawful neutral to migrated toward lawful good. I don't know. I always like to pretend I was chaotic good, but I don't think so. Let's be honest. Wait, how would you define yourself? Probably neutral good, I think. I'm very very boring. I think I'm just lawful good. No, you're chaotic. I'm not chaotic. I think I'm Alan may be the actually. least chaotic, but I think it may be more of a lawful neutral Seriously? Thing. Yeah. This is fascinating. See, it's interesting because you get to find out like not only how you see yourself, but how other people see you. Can yeah. you be lawful good and a troll at the same time? That's that's. My see, that's question. why I think that you're not lawful good. Yeah, that's what makes you lawful neutral. <laughs> I guess I am lawful neutral. Exactly. I always say I, in in uh, you know when I used to read fantasy novels, I always I always I always identified most with the uh, with the neutral wizards. Not the good or bad wizards. They're just the chilling. Wizards. The red robes. Raceland Majir. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that, that ended But then it ended poorly. That ended poorly. There's, like a, there's been like a resurgence in like 90s fantasy stuff recently. It was I, really I don't know if you good. noticed this. Like Wheel of Time. There, it's, it's like a thing. It's because it's weird. one of my generation now runs Hollywood and now they're producing <laughs> the things they want to do. <laughs> Not that hard to explain. I actually think you're, you're probably right. <laughs> It's the same reason why every bar I go into plays music I like now, because the manager is my age. (laughs) (laughs) And hello, everyone. Welcome back to Rational Security for the third year, starting almost. I guess not really technically until the next episode, but uh, welcome to what is our second anniversary episode. I am thrilled to be here for two years and counting with my two regular co-hosts in the virtual studio, Alan Rosenstein. We haven't killed each other yet. Well, yet, but we got a whole hour to record, so we'll see. And Quinta Jurassic. Hello. Quinta, Quinta the juror, Jurassic, the final juror, <laughs> judge, juror, and what? executioner. <laughs> uh, I was trying to throw sure. your Jurassic into something. I think it kind of counts. That's good. No one has, no one ever tried that with me. I got a lot of Jurassic Park. Jurassic um, Park, season, but... yeah. 
Yeah, yeah it was super obvious. That does, No one gets points for that one. Although in your generation, wouldn't it be like Jurassic World jokes? No, it was Jurassic Park. All right, All right. well. My generation. Your generation, you youths. Uh, well, regardless, I am thrilled to be here, you guys. Uh, we are uh, have celebrating our two-year anniversary, two years straight, of what was once Rational Security 2.0, now just Rational Security, having abolished the old regime and sundered its memory uh, out of our history books and textbooks. And we are celebrating, as we did last year, with another edition of the game show rendition of Rational Security, Hot Take Takedown. So for those who may have missed last year's Hot Take Takedown, here are the rules. We are going to be presented with a number of hot takes this year. The contestants are not ourselves. We instead are the jury passing judgments on the hot takes of our lawfare colleagues, several of whom have submitted hot takes for our consideration. We will then debate the hot take and determine whether we feel, where we feel it falls on the Goldilocks scale. Is it too cool and not worth the effort? Is it too hot, too muy caliente, and therefore a little bit more than we can handle? Or is it just right? I know Moy Caliente doesn't mean too hot. It just means very hot. Yeah, right? that means too very hot. Too very hot. There you go. There you go. I think that captures the theme that we're going for here. I took French in high school. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and we, we are uh, going to see who is the winner out of this year's episode. Are you guys ready to get started? Let's do it. All right. For our first contestant, we have none other than a Lawfare Senior Editor and Brookings Institution Senior Fellow Molly Reynolds with a hot take. Let's hear from Molly. There's not going to be a government shutdown this fall. That's not to say things won't be ugly and to be sure, even threatened shutdowns are costly. Agencies have to expend resources getting ready for them that could be used elsewhere. Uh, NOR is resorting to short-term continuing resolutions that keep the lights on great either. Uh, temporary spending bills make it really hard for agencies to function in the way that we want them to. But for a shutdown to happen, some set of actors has to want it, and they have to be sufficiently pivotal in the outcome to make it happen. Uh, take, for example, the record length shutdown at the end of 2018, the beginning of 2019. There, it wasn't enough that there was a faction of congressional Republicans who were willing to hold out for border wall funding in exchange for their votes for a measure keeping the government open. It was also that they had convinced President Trump to go along with their plan and to refuse to sign a measure unless it contained that money. This year, uh, there are certainly members, especially within the House Republican Conference, who want to shut down. But unlike in 2018, they don't have the president on their side. In addition, the members who most strongly want to shut down are unlikely to vote for any spending bill, short-term continuing resolution or otherwise, that can also pass the Senate. Uh, this is not just because Democrats have a majority in the Senate. It's also because enough Senate Republicans are interested in keeping the government open. House Republicans have also struggled to get enough votes in their conference for their own versions of individual spending bills, which demonstrates the weakness of their position vis-a-vis -vis the Senate. In the spring, it was House Republicans' ability to stick together and pass a measure of raising the debt limit on a party-line basis that ultimately helped bring the White House to the negotiating table, but they've been unable to do so as of yet with spending bills. In addition, Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy isn't behaving like someone who's accepting that his hardliners will rule the day. Uh, he's proposed doing a one-month continuing resolution. He's argued to his conference that a shutdown would interfere with their ability to continue investigating President Biden and potentially pursue an impeachment inquiry. Uh, I'm prepared to get angry messages from all the federal employees listening to this, not to mention people who depend on the copious federal programs that require the government staying open, um, if I'm wrong, but I am willing to offer this as my hot take. Ooh. That's All a spicy right. take. That's, that's a hot take. Can, can I say one story before we start debating this on the merits? Please. So in the the last shutdown that Molly mentioned, the, the, the record one, it, it like two days after it started, I went to a 10-day silent Vipassana meditation <laughs> retreat. These are not related, I don't think. Which was an amazing experience. Happy to talk more about it. I think everyone should do it once in their life. So I go and I do this 10-day meditation retreat. It's like really intense, really long. And then I come out of it and my, my wife picks me up at the retreat center. And the first question she asked me, well, the first question she asked me was whether I attained enlightenment. And then having concluded that I had not indeed attained enlightenment, she was like, by the way, you know the shutdown's still going on? And it just like blew my mind that like, <laughs> I I like I, maybe because it was silent, but it felt like I was in that meditation retreat for 
several karmic lifetimes and just walking out and realizing that the government was still shut down was just an amazing experience. I don't know. That, that's really, that stuck with me all, all these years. It's like, welcome back to reality. Exactly. During what was probably that same shutdown, I ended up almost having to sleep on my car on the side of the Highway 1 in California because I was on a road trip uh, and neglected the fact that state parks along Highway 1 that normally are not that popular (laughs) get wildly popular when all the national parks are shut down. And so it was so crowded. There were like people just like in their cars sleeping because they've been counting like me on getting a hotel room on the side. I finally got a tent at a campground where I spent the night. Oh Um, my God. Yeah. So shutdowns are no joke. Which is why it's pretty interesting that Molly here is willing to put herself out on a limb uh, against what, let's be honest, Everybody in media wants to see a shutdown. Nobody's saying we don't want to see a shutdown. They, it's a sort of fight. I feel like this is a sort of thing that like national political commentariat and like, you know, the, 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 what's, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? The rat race kind of political coverage. Horse race. Waiting for. Horse race. Uh, political coverage wants is this sort of confrontation. This kind of, uh, kind of unconventional. What do y'all make of the take on the substance to begin with? Then we can talk about how hot or cold it is, but is it, does it carry water for you all? I mean, I, I will say with respect to the commentary, this is one of these classic bad for the nation, but tremendous content kind of situations. A good old government shutdown. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, yeah, on that point, I mean, I think it's worth pointing out, like, I think that it's so good for the press because it's regular content, right? Like there's a thing, it's happening, it will continue happening. You know that you're going to be able to cover it. Um, so, you know, great for like cable news, which needs to fill... 24 hours a day with God knows what. And it's also really good for, as you say, like horse race, you know, who's up, who's down, frankly, substanceless journalism, because it doesn't raise like the thing with shutdowns. I don't, I'll be interested to know if Molly listens to this and she thinks I'm totally wrong. My impression has been that they pretend to be about policy, but they're not actually about policy, right? They're about, you know, horse trading and people being stupid (laughs) And trying to appear like you've gouged enough flesh out of your opponent for you to be able to back down, right? There's no actual political advantage that is gained from it. It's just like a thing that we do now. And so there's a real benefit for reporters who take that model of kind of, you know, the Democrats did this and then the Republicans did that. And, you know, what? who will win, right? Um, it's a very, very clear narrative that like you know it spawns a lot of takes even though i think it's ultimately stupid pointless substanceless bad for america yeah on on the substance i have to say i mean obviously i'm I'm, i get very nervous when i disagree with molly reynolds on anything related to congress but i don't know i think this take might just be a little too spicy for me i mean there i just think so many factors pushing for a government shutdown you know, one of which is that I think there is a perception, true or not, that government shutdowns are, you know, often worse for the party in the White House because it's their government that's not working, especially close to an election. I, th- you know, and obviously that that favors Republicans. You know, McCarthy, maybe he's not acting as someone who is going to let the radicals, you know, take him for a ride, but they can whenever they want to because of the way the numbers work and petitions to discharge the chair, petitions to defenestrate the speaker or something, whatever the technical term is uh, that he negotiated a way to get the speakership in the first place. You know, un- unlike the debt limit, which really could have catastrophic consequences, you know, a, a government shutdown, while again, obviously a big deal, is not going to tank the economy is not going to tank the country. And so I think that, you know, the kind of radical Republican fringe that might have at the end of the day just not been willing to go quite to that brink, they'd totally be willing to do this because it's been done in the past without you know, too many terrible consequences, you know, at least in sort of a macro level. And then it's going to be in the context of a presidential election where, you know, if Donald Trump is still the front runner, as I think he likely will be, why would it be in his interest to do anything other then argue for a government shutdown, you know, to, to show that the Biden administration is in chaos, maybe to detract from his own ongoing 17 trials. So you put all that together, I just feel like the pressures for a government shutdown are going to be enormous. And because of how the House works, it's just very easy for that to happen, um, you know, even if it does get resolved relatively quickly. I will say I would never bet against Molly on an issue that had to do with the dynamics in Congress, which I think is separate. We're, we're all terrified of Molly <laughs> not, with her like, vast knowledge I'm, of Congress. I, am, I have respect. And a little bit of terror. It's okay. <laughs> 
What I will say is that I'm going to set that aside for the moment um, and evaluate the relative hotness of the take separately. Uh, because I think otherwise I would just say like, go with Molly, be not afraid. Um, so I think that, I mean, it is interesting that she, if I'm understanding her correctly, seems to be kind of pointing out that like, part of the reason why she thinks there won't be a shutdown is actually that the House Republicans are so disorganized, right? Like it's it's a little bit, you know, there's a the, the bell curve where you you start off not having a shutdown because you're organized and then you have a shutdown because you're like, a mess and then you become so much of a mess that you can't actually get together enough to like have a consistent list of stuff that you want in order to get a shutdown in the first place. And that it seems if I'm, again, if I'm understanding Molly correctly, that that actually means that the dynamics between the House Republican caucus and McCarthy and the Senate are such that they might not actually be able to get it together to pull this off, which I think is, is kind of interesting. Like we've, we've come through to the other side which is maybe good in a, a small way. So I find that interesting. I mean, beyond that, I don't know. I mean, I guess my question is like, if we are in that place, what that means for how we think about shutdowns going forward. And I think Molly's point is that, you know, things are going to be ugly. There's going to be nasty stuff happening regardless. Um, so are we now in a place where like you threaten a shutdown with the understanding that it won't actually happen, given that shutdown, the whole point of a shutdown is that the Republicans are willing to carry out the threat and Democrats tend to be the ones who want to push back on it. How does that play into it? I don't know. I think it raises interesting questions. I mean, I should say I have taken the risk of a shutdown seriously enough that I warned someone who was planning a trip to a national park that they should maybe go in September instead of October. <laughs> um, and they took that advice. Uh, so if it turns out that there wasn't a shutdown and October would have been better uh, to that person uh, who I think is listening, I'm very sorry. I, I would also say just on, on sort of, you know, putting, putting our money where our mouth is. I mean, I'm, I'm part of a group that, are, you know, organizes a, a cybersecurity conference and we were going to do it at the Naval Academy. And, and, uh, you know, the, the, the response was, we can do it, but you would be completely insane to try to host something at a federal institution in late September, early October. <laughs> and so we did not because we were worried about government shutdown. This was, this was months ago. You could do it at St. John's instead across the street and just talk about great books. Ooh, sounds better. <laughs> Well, I agree. It is certainly something to be taken seriously, uh, which is why I, w I don't think Molly would want her take to be taken as, as kind of a false hope for people to take it seriously. But I think we're kind of missing what makes it so hot. But I think maybe not too hot. I think maybe just the right amount of hot is that this is really a closet endorsement of Kevin McCarthy as speaker, right? You know, essentially what Molly's saying here, I think, is that she thinks Kevin McCarthy actually has the spine to stand up to the people who want to shut down the government in his caucus and doesn't think that they're going to be able to threaten him effectively enough to actually drive a shutdown. It's kind of the opposite of what you're saying, Alan. Your, set, your prediction is that because the institutional threshold is so low to threaten Kevin McCarthy, the assumption is, and this is true, this is the conventional wisdom that went into his speakership, is that he will have to flip on the parts of his caucus who want to do these crazy things. But I think Molly is telling us, actually, I don't think they're going to be able to pull it off. I think Kevin McCarthy is going to stand strong. That's pretty spicy, I think, as a take. I don't know if she likes me phrasing it that way. I would have I would have liked a little more direct as a, a actual endorsement as opposed to a shadow endorsement. That'd be really spicy. But I, I think that's what's happening here. Am I wrong? No, I mean, I, I, I guess that's right. I just I just don't think it's true. Like, I just I think he got very lucky in the debt limit debate. And I just, I just don't, I, I just, I, I, I don't expect that to happen again in, in the shutdown. I think part of it is, I think part of it is like how you, how you frame the question. Cause if the take is there's not going to be a prolonged government shutdown, fine. I can probably get behind that, but that's not as spicy as there will not be a government shutdown. And like the threshold for a government shutdown is depressingly low. I think this is spicy. Even, yeah. even if you don't, even if you don't include the shadow endorsement of Kevin McCarthy. And I really wonder if, if Molly somewhere is twitching, not realizing why, as we're all ascribing the <laughs> Kevin McCarthy endorsement to her. <laughs> I, I will just say, even short government shutdowns can be terrible, um, apart from, you know, all of the actual and serious disruption they cause to people's lives. Uh, remember that like three day government shutdown in like, I don't know, 2018, maybe? That was the one chance that I've had in my life to go to Fort Sumter and it was closed and I'm still mad about it. 
Poor shame. Poor shame. I know. Well, folks, I think I think it may be time to vote about how we're feeling about this. Are you guys ready to vote? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Quinta, how do you feel about this hot take? Where where do you come out on it? I'm going to go with just right. I think it combines uh, unexpectedness, which adds a certain je ne sais quoi, um, and is definitely required for spice, uh, with genuine expertise and thoughtfulness on the matter. And that is exactly what I am looking for in a hot take. All right, Alan, how about you? You know, I I agree that there is 100% genuine expertise, um, but I just, this is a little too spicy for me. Ooh. Well, I'm going to be honest with you all. I'm sitting here at these three bowls of porridge in front of me, and I think this is a third bowl of porridge. I'm with Quinta. I think this type is pretty right. It's a subtle spicy. It's a spicy because it's trying to hide how spicy it really is. Because Molly lacks the courage of her convictions. No, it's like Indian food. There's, it's layered. There you go. It's a yeah, exactly. There's a lot of coriander, and you're like, "What is that? Is that coriander?" And you're like, "No, it couldn't be." But no, you're right. It's coriander. Um, God, everyone is switching off their podcast <laughs> app right now. What is your what favorite I... spice? <laughs> there you yeah, go. No, that's th- we should honestly we should end with that because I I have strong feelings. <laughs> about that, actually. All right, let's not get too let's not get too sidetracked on this one. Well, I think we have ourselves a determination that this take is just right. We will see whether it is more right than the other takes on our agenda at the end of the episode. But for now, let's move on to our second take. This take comes to us from Lawfare Managing Editor Tyler McBrien. Let's hear from Tyler. My name is Tyler McBrien. I'm the managing editor of Lawfare, and for my hot take, I am taking aim at no less than one of the most well-entrenched orthodoxies, I would say, of U.S. foreign policy, and that is uh, the permanent stationing of troops at overseas bases. This has been a tenet of U.S. national security strategy since World War II, maybe even before then, um, and I think it's, it's time to change. My hot take is this. The U.S. should significantly reduce its troop presence abroad and this means drawing down our empire of bases. Um, so first, just a lay of the land. Uh, today, the U.S. has more overseas military bases than every other country combined. An estimated 750 bases spread across 80 or more countries and constitute up to 85% of the world's total overseas military bases. Um, this is likely more than any other people, nation, or empire in history. And I think this orthodoxy is only hardening as uh, China also builds up bases. Proponents would say that bases, U.S. bases in particular, deter enemies, reassure allies, and help the U.S. military respond rapidly. But I think this really doesn't hold water. Uh, You know, instead of deterring enemies, they often provoke them. Um, I think this is due to labor violations, criminal conduct by U.S. soldiers, violations of sovereignty that often occur at or near U.S. military bases by U.S. soldiers. Um, And I think this is also reflected in the uh, anti-basing protests that have occurred in, in over 30 countries since World War II, by one count. I think uh, if you don't believe me, you can just listen to General Mark Milley. I think no no isolationist, no pacifist by any means, um, who said in December 2020 that the U.S. has, quote, too much infrastructure overseas and too much permanent infrastructure, characterizing many bases as just kind of derivative of of where World War II ended. Um, so this is just a holdover of, of Cold War thinking. It's time to, to move past it. And I think uh, this, this strategy is no longer compelling and actually counterproductive. I can see the takedowns already. I think Alan will probably dismiss me as a, as a lily-livered pacifist, and Scott will tell me to take this crass isola- isolationism to the Quincy Institute, where it belongs, Uh, Quinta may forgive me as a well-intentioned yet ultimately naive idealist, but warmongers be damned, it's time to bring the troops home. (laughs) I'm Tyler McBride, and that was my hot, spicy take. (laughs) Oh, man, I love how he got the little jabs at us in there. That was... That was excellent. That's pretty on point, (laughs) if I'm being honest. Do we even need to respond? He knows everything we're going to say. I know. He kind of nailed it. Well, yeah. What do you all think of this one? I think this is this is certainly a, a, a caliente take from our own spicy Tyler. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I feel paralyzed. I don't know what to say now because I've been, you know, I've been read, as they say. 
In all seriousness, I mean, I think I think it's a it's an interesting argument. I'm curious to hear what you all both think, because as Tyler says, I am perhaps as listeners might have guessed, more sympathetic to this argument than either than uh, either of you might be. I don't know. Um, I will say, if you get to a point where Mark Milley is agreeing with you, I actually don't know. That may lead me to downgrade the spice. It's like adding some cheese into the into the mix. What do you guys think? Oh, it's like a it's like in uh, like a Korean kimchi stew, but that you put American cheese, which is can I just say which is a good thing to do, which is and itself comes from American soldiers at correct. South <laughs> Korean <laughs> bases <laughs> bringing American cheese in there. That's that's why that's that's why that's why there are these amazing, super authentic, like literally, legitimately super authentic South Korean stews with hot dogs and spam and kim and uh, American cheese on top of them. Um, so I I think culinarily, I think uh, Tyler is just wrong because obviously American bases have. I've done a lot of good that way. I mean, it's an interesting. No, I mean, I, 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 I think. I mean, I think, I think it's an interesting take. Um, obviously, there's probably something to it. I mean, I think the problem is like, at what margin are you talking about, right? Because, you know, like, there are probably too many bases. For the same reason, there were probably too many bases in the United States locally, um, which is that they're part of the military industrial complex and there are lots of economic reasons to have bases, blah, blah, blah. And so closing a base is really difficult. And so you can have a situation where everyone agrees that there are too many bases, but just the incentives to close any particular one, um, are low. Um, so, you know, if that's the argument, then yeah, they're probably, probably have, should, should have some fewer bases. And also if the argument is, you know, bases aren't as well run as they should be and there are these pressure points about American, you know, uh, members of the military committing crimes or otherwise causing problems. I, I mean, that's that's bad, obviously. That's a very serious concern. It, seems, it does seem like a f- more fixable problem if you put enough effort into it. So, I mean, if, if that's the take, it's, I think, pretty unobjectionable. I mean, I think the more interesting question is not, you know, just – lowering the number of Amer- of bases abroad, but really drawing down the overseas American presence. Because, you know, if, if it's a if it's a base near your border or if it's carrier group near your border, I mean it's still near your border. And so if that's the concern about provoking other countries, I'm not sure the the base issue is so relevant. And then it's an argument about, you know, just not projecting power abroad nearly as aggressively. And that would be a spicy take. Yeah, you know, this take is interesting. I, I, here's what I, why I, I actually may, may think this is a little bit of a too cool take. There is a, this is kind of like a longstanding perspective, right? Like this is something we've heard argued since the end of the Cold War, or frankly, even in the last, the kind of waning decade or two of the Cold War, about people coming up with critiques about this. And it is a moment where it is in an intellectual style that has become very popular. Restraint uh, has political appeal kind of on the left and right kind of a popular view right now that you hear a lot echoed in op-ed pages and lots of other places um, that's being, you know, kind of aligned with new institutions like Quincy Institute that Tyler mentioned in his prompt. A lot of other groups, a lot of them say smart things, some of which I, I agree with, some of which I don't, but it is writing an intellectual moment where people kind of having soured on international interventionism in the aftermath of Afghanistan and Iraq have begun to say, well, let's ride this pendulum as far as it will go. Maybe all sorts of overseas deployments are a problem. And I'm not sure it actually spends much time critically looking at them enough to make that argument, at least in this particular case. Now, that's not fair to Tyler. We only give him two or three minutes, but that's the nature of the hot take, right? And I, I think it you tend to hear a lot of these arguments that, that categorize or kind of make a singular phenomenon out of what is in reality a bunch of smaller strategic choices saying, well, you know, just overseas troop deployment just isn't worth the effort. And I'm not sure that is such an easy thing to just boil down to one variable. Here, you know, we've also are hitting a moment where we've actually seen kind of renewed interest in overseas U.S. troops deployments among allies. Like, bear in mind, we just entered into new agreements for new U.S. forward deployments in Philippines, in Japan, uh, really all across different parts of Asia, South Korea, um, that were actively sought out by the governments in those states, precisely because they're worried about Chinese influence and they do see the basing of U.S. forces there as a substantial deterrent. We're seeing similar conversations with Ukraine already. We've seen Finland and Sweden join NATO, which strongly implies a relationship, maybe not basing troops. So, you know, I actually think the moment for this take and where it was most descriptively accurate 
with what foreign governments want, at least, has passed. Uh, you know, I think it would take that lined up maybe a lot more 10, 15 years ago, maybe even five or 10 years ago. But it's, I think it's harder to line it up with the actual facts we see them today. If it was about permanent basing, and that's really what Tyler's getting at, and that's what Mark Milley's comment is about. He was literally critiquing the hard infrastructural structure of saying, oh, we're going to have permanent base in all these countries. He was saying we need more mobile deployments, but was not actively saying we shouldn't send troops overseas. He was actually saying the opposite, that we should be able to send them different places more quickly, um, as I recall. You know, that's different. Like, I do think there's a good argument to say, yeah, maybe we don't need permanent U.S. villages scattered around the world. And in the same way, there's certainly, a, I think, a very valid critique for sometimes how the United States structures these, these things through its status of forces agreements, which tend to have huge jurisdictional carve-outs for U.S. troops that cause all sorts of friction with local host governments um, and lead to a lot of those protests Tyler mentioned. But that's really different from saying withdraw troops. That, that's about how you send troops overseas. Uh, and the actual case for sending troops overseas, if perhaps in a different, better way, you know, certainly the demand appears to be there. Um, I think the strategic logic behind it is still kind of in, in play. I'm not sure. Like I said, it strikes me as a, as, a, as a take that's maybe a little bit past its prime. That's brutal. Poor Tyler. T- to be clear, Tyler is not past his prime. Tyler is not past his prime. Tyler remains as spicy as ever. And I quite like his foreign <laughs> policy. This take was, uh, he, he did a lo- longer form in a foreign policy piece, I will plug. But I think it's an e- interesting read. And, and look, I mean, a lot of these takes are intended to 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 borrow a phrase that like Quinta likes, although maybe she's soured on it now that we use it so much, to open the Overton window and to pluck <laughs> conventional <laughs> wisdom. And for that purpose, perhaps there's some value to it. But as a, like I said, I'm, I'm not sure it's as, quite as fresh as we're looking. Is fresh different from cold? Or is yeah. it stale different from cold, I guess? I think I think cold is what I'm getting at. This this bowl of porridge has been out on the counter for a while. It is it is solidifying back to just like out of a, a so block. It's stale and cold. Youch. Brutal. Tyler, poor Tyler. Man. Sorry, well, buddy. You know, look with, I say it with look, love. We we tell the we tell the truth on rational security. This is we're truth tellers. But on the plus side, this means that we all kind of agree with you, Tyler. I guess it does. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I think we should vote. You think we should vote? Are we ready to vote on this one? Sure. All right. Quinta, how do you vote on Tyler's hot take? I, I am going to go regretfully with not spicy enough. Um, with apologies to Tyler, because I do think that it is a good take. I just don't know if it's a hot one. Fair. And Alan, how about you? What is your take on this hot take? I'm going with, with, you know, white people spicy, which is to say, not spicy enough. Just thinking in terms oh, of time. From Minnesota, no less. That's rough. That's harsh. Yeah, yeah. Min- Minnesota spicy. That's right. Yeah. Minnesota <laughs> Thai restaurant, default spicy. Oof, that's, that's brutal. And Tyler, unfortunately, I'm going to have to agree with that one as well. I fear this take is slightly undercooked. But thank you for playing, and we appreciate it. But I fear this one may not be... The bowl of porridge we take home today, this evening, on our Goldilocks scale. Well, for our third contestant, we have none other than former Rational Security co-host and lawfare editor-in-chief, Benjamin Wittes, who's brought us another hot take for us to consider on this year's Hot Take Takedown. Let's hear from Ben. With all the drama of Vladimir Putin shooting Yevgeny Prigozhin's plane out of the sky, it has become fashionable once again to see Putin as having staying power. So I want to advance this hottest of hot takes. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin will see the inside of a prison cell before Donald J. Trump will. The reason... The absence of due process in the society that he has constructed. Uh, you can be super powerful, super villain, but it's really fragile. And when the end comes, it comes fast and it comes hard. And unlike for Donald Trump, you don't get to file motions to dismiss and litigate them on an interlocutory basis. And you don't get to run for president while you're doing it. Well, Benjamin, big prediction for the year. The man, if nothing else, knows how to uh, frame his historical moment. What do you guys make of this one? 
I mean, I think I think it's a good take in sort of the spicy. It is sort of appropriately spicy. I I do think it's wrong though. Um, <laughs> you know, th- there's an interesting question of like what the take is. Like, are we do we have to peg it to Donald Trump? Uh, but just taking sort of Putin and his survivability uh, on its own merits. I mean, I think Ben is totally right that we tend to overstate the stability of autocratic regimes and that they are much more fragile than they appear to be from the outside. At the same time, though, one should not underestimate the stability that they can have. I mean, there are plenty of autocrats that rule for decades and decades and decades. And there are plenty of autocrats that do so as their countries do worse and worse and worse. I mean, obviously, North Korea is the best example, but it's only one of, of many. And I think the the thing that we have to remember, and, and this is not a pleasant thing to appreciate because it doesn't bode well for the war in Ukraine, is that Russia's doing okay. You know, at the end of the day, Russia is just a petrostate. Um, it runs entirely on oil. That is its one major export. And oil prices are high, and they will likely be high for the foreseeable future. Russia also has good trading partners, not just China, but also a lot of, you know, what used to be called the non-aligned world, the BRICS and so forth. And so, you know, in terms of paying off those people that Putin needs to pay off, I mean, he can do so in the foreseeable future, not for, you know, maybe 10 years or 15 or 20 years, though, of course, he himself is an elderly man. So he probably doesn't even himself necessarily want to rule literally until he dies, though, who knows. But I just think, unfortunately, Russia's strategic position, because it is sitting on, you know, I think it's the largest oil reserves, or at the very least, I think it's the largest gas reserves in the world, those are going to continue to fund Putin and fund whoever he has to buy off. And so, you know, while I, I like the take, and it's, again, certainly possible, I still think more likely than not, Putin is just going to keep riding this out. Well, so, Alan, I don't 100% agree with that. I, I think I agree with your bottom line on this take. I, I will note, you know, the Russian economy actually has looked pretty bad the last month or two. I don't know if you've been tracking uh, the numbers. Like a lot of the global economic impact of the economic sanctions that have been imposed since the Ukraine war started are really beginning to bear. And this is actually what a lot of economists kind of predicted. They said, look, you know, the psychological impact of the sanctions hopefully was going to have earlier effect. That didn't really work. But the actual economic impacts would build over time, particularly because Russia central bank and financial institutions, which are actually fairly competently run and are well endowed with a lot of reserves quite deliberately to help insulate the economy from sanctions after the 2014 Crimea uh, conflict uh, and uh, debate, they essentially were going to have a runway where they were able to keep things stable, but it was a finite resource. And those resources, that toolkit, become a lot slimmer. Now, does that mean Putin is going to lose power? I don't know about that, right? Like, But I think it does mean there's a lot more pressure building on the Russian state arising out of the Ukraine war, and that that could and very well might ultimately threaten Putin. I do think that's kind of what makes this a hot take, right? Like, it is a little bit of a race to the finish line for for Vladimir Putin on one hand and former President Trump on the one hand. The question is, how long will these proceedings go? And then how far will, you know, how fast will the Russian economy collapse? I tend to think you're probably right. The economy's not, the state, I should say, not the economy, is not quite as precipitous a decline as to match the fairly quick pace at which some of these trials are getting underway. But uh, I'm not sure exactly. And the trick here is that the way Ben phrased his take, right, it's to see the inside of a jail cell. That's that's tricky to me because I'm not sure either of these guys sees it inside of the jail cell, even if they are held accountable to, uh, to some extent. You know, former President Trump, I think, you know, you might see a pardon under Republican administration. You might see fairly generous sentencing on the part of the Justice Department or the court system, uh, or depending on the types of charges he's ultimately convicted on. And he's probably not going to go to jail until relevant appeals are exhausted, uh, at least if there's any that look pretty serious. I think there'll be a lot of reservations about doing that while those process is ongoing. So it could be quite a while if he ever sees him to have a jail cell. For Putin, as we talked about on the podcast before, I think a jail cell is a lot less likely than just death. Uh, because as long as Putin's still alive, he's going to have a lot of political sway that's going to be a real threat to whatever the successor regime might be. And Russia doesn't seem to have a lot of a lot of Russians and the people who might be positioned to take power after him might have a lot more compunctions, fewer compunctions, I should say, about doing something to remove Putin more permanently than putting him in a jail cell. Right. So he may not see the inside of a jail cell, but he might see the outside of a building as he falls past it. After exactly. You you are so marvelously morbid on this one, Quinta. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, so I think that the hotness of the take, as you say, Scott, is kind of dependent on how you think of the way it's constructed. Because I do think, you know, if you say, if the prediction is once Putin loses power or if Putin loses power, he will, you know, be jailed or die or whatever, then I think, you know, more swiftly than justice will come for Trump. I think that's obviously true. But focusing on the question of the stability of the regime, I mean, I think that I'm going to be incredibly pretentious and say what this reminds me of is there's a a really great book about the last years of the Soviet Union by Alexei Yurchak that's called uh, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More. Um, And that's very specifically about sort of the late Soviet period. But I think what I, what is so great about that title is that it communicates that, you know, these regimes and these systems seem stable and eternal and impossible to get rid of or change in any way until they don't. Um, And then everything can change very, very suddenly. And I feel like that's kind of the place that we're in right now with Russia, where it's sort of impossible to imagine to riff on the title of another excellent book about Russia, um, Russia Without Putin, which is a great book by Tony Wood. But if it comes, it will probably come very suddenly and less unexpectedly than it it might have before. So where do we think this puts it on the hotness scale then? Because I kind of feel like this one's just kind of like overshooting its skis a bit, right? Like it's a hot take. Saying like, oh, Putin is going to be held accountable before Trump is. Like that's hot. That's spicy. But, and I I see the direction it's going in, right? It's a novel idea. I don't think a lot of people are saying it. I think that's part of the hotness, but I think it might be just trying too hard to get the different, you know, square pegs into round holes to make that argument work. I think that, I think to me, this one reads as a little too spicy, a little too caliente because it just doesn't quite hold together. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's overshot its goal of, you know, becoming a slate, a slate piece, um, which is kind of the, the closet standard here. I think I'm going to defend it. I mean, as much as I hate to say nice things about Ben Wittes, but no, I think this is a, I think this is a good take from Ben. I think it is just spicy enough. I think it has that, has that nice symmetry, right, between Putin and Trump. Um, you know, and I, I think like all good takes, it's probably wrong, but it's not obviously so. Oh, interesting. Well, all right. Is it time to vote on this one? Should we bring it to, a, bring it to the jury? Let's do it. All right. Quinta. On Benjamin Wittes' take, how do you vote? I'm going to go with too hot, by which I mean not that I disagree with him that things could change very quickly, but that the specific phrasing of it is particularly spicy, um, which may mean that it's very well suited for an op-ed, but I think still too hot for a take for me. All right, Alan, how do you vote? I'm going to go just right. It's it's like to me the mapo tofu of of takes. It's spicy, but there's a certain there's a certain there's a depth to it, which is what you get from the Sichuan peppercorn. So I think it's a good take. I mean, that's where you're wrong, Alan, because it's not from the Sichuan peppercorn, it's from the fermented broad beans. That's where you get the flavor from mapo tofu. Everybody knows that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. I said Okay, f- okay. First of all, you get flavor from lots of places. You get the citrusy Mouth numbing notes from the Sichuan peppercorn. You do get the umami from the fermented broad bean paste. Don't pre- don't 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 bring you don't uh, don't pretend like you know more about mapo than me, son. This is reminding me that I haven't made mapo for a while. Oh yeah, so good. It's in my week. It's in my weekly rotation for dinner. Dinner at one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, me amazing. Uh, so well, good. for Ben's take, I am going to uh, do the rare triple hat trick with Quinta and lining up with the same views. I have to vote too spicy on this one. Too hot. <laughs> You know, I, this strikes me as the type of take that you send to your friend, the editor in 50 words. And they're like, oh yeah, write that up. And then, and then you start writing and you're like, oh wait, I don't know. I said they're both in a jail cell. How, how does that work? And it begins to not quite <laughs> hold together as you write it. <laughs> you know? Are you speaking from experience? Yeah, Scott? Have, have has this scarred? ever happened to you? <laughs> it happened to me once or twice, you know? Uh, and uh, I, that is, that is to me, that is the, the definition of a too hot take is, is you can say it in a sentence, but when you try and turn it into 800 or a thousand words, it, you can't quite get it to hold together in a way that's satisfactory. And that's, that's where I think we're at on this one. So 
Mr. Wittis, so sorry. I'm afraid your take is too hot. Leaving us with one clear victor with a two to one vote in favor of being just right. And that is our own Lawfare Senior Editor, Molly Reynolds. Molly, congratulations on emerging from this year's hot take takedown as our champion. We all saw that coming. I think Molly wins every competition she enters. Bravo, Molly. I think that's right. Bravo. Now let's hear from Molly in her own words, a little bit of a victory speech. Having finished third in Lawfare's uh, Staff Fantasy Football League last year, I am uh, very happy to finally have taken home a uh, Lawfare Extended Universe-related uh, trophy. Um, and the best thing about my hot take is that we will know in a few short weeks uh, whether I am right or whether I am wrong. And I look forward uh, to coming on Rat Sex sometime later this year to either be celebrated or mocked uh, for my accuracy. Well, folks, on that celebratory note, we are out of time for this anniversary episode of Rational Security, but it still would not be Rational Security if we did not leave you with some object lesson to ponder over in the week to come until we are back in your podcatchers. Alan, what do you have for us this week? So I have a plum tree outside my house, and it grows these really small, incredibly tart and astringent plums. And so I have not really known what to do with them because like you can't really use them sort of as an eating plum or I'm not even convinced as a cooking plum. But I came across this very cool set of YouTube videos on a South Korean technique called, and I'm going to mispronounce this, so my apologies, called chung, which is basically this technique, which I guess is very popular in South Korea, though I'm sure there are versions of this around the world, where you take fruit and you just combine it with sugar and you just leave it alone for days, weeks, and in the case of like sour plums, you can do it for months on end. And the sugar draws out all the liquid from the fruit and mellows out any astringent bits. And you get this just amazing fruit syrup, which you can, I really like it just with soda water um, as a kind of like a kind of a soda thing. You can pour it on like cereal, like oatmeal. You can use, I mean, it's unbelievably tasty. So I did this with these plums and it's, I mean, it's only been like a week and this stuff is so, so, so good. So um, I really recommend you do that. You can just buy store-bought fruit or if you can, if you have a fruit tree in your backyard, it's a great way to use fruit that you're not going to eat. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll link to this uh, set of, of YouTube videos, um, which are, are a great explanation of how to do it. Ooh, I have heard about this in the context of cocktails, of people using maybe the same type of plum, maybe not as a, a great cocktail syrup. Um, so I'm very intrigued uh, and we'll t- check this out myself. Yeah, I have a feeling that this, like what I just made would go incredibly well with some mezcal. I'm, I'm very excited to try that. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, a little, a little, a little Mexico, a little bit of South Korea. Mix it up. I'm, I'm a fan. Quinta, what do you have for us this week? I would like to use as my object lesson the Burning Man discourse. So, for listeners who have not followed, there was a big rainstorm at Burning Man this year, which created problems because it is in the desert, and I guess the specific kind of dirt that is there. I don't actually know anything about Burning Man. Uh, turns into a very nasty. A heavy mud when it rains, uh, which created mass chaos. There are definitely, you know, bad aspects to this. I have nothing against Burning Man, though I do think that people who are very into it can be annoying. But what I would like to focus on is the content that it created Firefest style. Um, in particular, the post by one Neil Katyal who posted a selfie on Twitter of himself in like a multicolor beanie situation. It was something um, about how he was there at Burning Man. And I believe he had escaped through the mud. I'm not totally clear, but had enjoyed it. Um, And then that led to uh, everybody's favorite uh, subject of DC bar discipline and a criminal defendant in the state of Georgia uh, and possible future attorney general, Jeffrey Clark tweeting uh, something derogatory about it. So there, there was a, it was a whole good time for everybody. And I haven't even gotten to the people on Reddit who were posting jokes about how everybody had Ebola, which turned into a meme that then apparently some people believed. Um, there was not Ebola at Burning Man, as far as I know. And it was a very entertaining few hours of internet surfing for me this weekend. So if you were at Burning Man, I hope you had a good time and that you got out safely. Uh, but it was very entertaining to follow. I think it's also worth mentioning that among the other uh, similar celebrity pairings that arise 
arose out of this year's disastrous Burning Man was the fact that apparently comedian Chris Rock and DJ Diplo yes. uh, hitchhiked together on their way out, which is amazing. Because uh, what an unlikely pairing. And they have video of them being picked up in a truck. Uh, and I would have thought I was hallucinating, which given that it was oh, yeah. Burning Man, is highly possible. Exactly. But my favorite part is that I saw a clip of Diplo talking about this from what appeared to be the fanciest hotel room I have ever seen on CNN. That would look like, you know, giant cavernous, like, you know, vaulted ceilings and everything. And I was like, oh, okay. So you're, you're over the whole camping in the desert thing very quickly, I guess. Uh, and back in luxury. And then he didn't even bother to make the bed. It was just like sheets tossed everywhere in the background. That's what the staff are like, for. I guess, I guess. I mean, if you're, if you're going to be on CNN, even if you're a famous DJ, just make the bed or just turn the camera the other way. Come on, guys. Come on. Well, for my object lesson, I am digging into a book that is out in a new edition that I found very, very influential on me, uh, as it is on many college students, most of whom forget about it. Uh, but it stuck with me, although, although I uh, followed its advice before that. And that is, of course the book Animal Liberation, um, which is out with a new edition called Animal Liberation Now. This is a book that suffers more than anything from its very unfortunate choice of titles. It, uh, Animal Liberation was not a great title. Animal, Animal Liberation Now sounds very strident and annoying title. Um, but this is, of course, Peter Singer's sort of signature uh, articulation of the case for greater animal rights and treatment of animals. Um, it is I've been rereading it, having not read it really since college, in this new edition, which brings in a ton of new information and studies and analysis and kind of retrospective of the last, what, I think 30 or 40 years, 50 years maybe, since the original version came out, which I think in the 1970s, I can't remember exactly when. And it is a phenomenal update to that volume. And it just reminds me of, like, actually, despite having such a strident title, like, how kind of thoughtful it is. And he's been doing a lot of interviews where Peter Singer is somebody who reaches these very demanding, uh, seemingly very impractical kind of moral conclusions about, you know, what it means to lead an ethical life in various contexts. He has similar kind of like strong views about poverty and things like that. Although in practice, he is always, uh, you know, kind of framing the ideal versus, you know, progress towards an ideal in a way that I think is much more practical and, and realistic. But the book is like, I think, really challenging and interesting and so much frankly, I think better reason to more compelling than I thought. And I, I and I found it to be a, uh, a, a just a fascinating read that I think a lot of people should read, not necessarily because I'd buy all the conclusions, even though I am a vegetarian and have been for most of my life at this point, but because I just think it's a fascinating, fascinating treatment of a topic that really all of us deal with and make decisions about in our day to day life. Uh, and it challenges it in very effective and kind of compelling ways. So if you have not read this book, and pretty if you haven't read it since college, because you probably as an adult might have a little bit more sophisticated reaction to it, I would encourage you to check it out. And the new edition is actually worth worth the reread because there's a lot of new interesting stuff in there. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of this very special second anniversary episode. But remember, Rational Security is, of course, a production of Lawfare. So be sure to visit lawfaremedia.org for our show page, for links to past episodes, for our written work, and the written work of other Lawfare contributors, and for information on Lawfare's other phenomenal podcast series. While you're at it, be sure to follow us on Twitter at RATL Security, and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. And sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon at patreon.com slash lawfare for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo. And our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. And we are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Pat Jahal, who is doing a truly heroic job in this week's episode. So sorry, Jen, and thank you so much. On behalf of my co-hosts, Alan and Quinta, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we'll talk to you next week. Till then, goodbye.